I am probably one of very few people present here who is not directly affiliated with the Pickler Association. And I feel very honored to be here today because I feel I'm here to prove to you what you already know, <laughs> which is a good, easy task, right? <laughs> that Dr. Pickler was an incredible visionary, that she was ahead of her time. So now Elsa demonstrated a piece of it experientially. Being a scientist, I do experiments all the time. I love experiments. So let me ask you to participate in the survey. Two questions. The first one, how many of you, as you were listening to the presenters today, thought, I wish I had a mother who was trained in Pickler? <laughs> <laughs> how many of you who are parents thought, I wish I was exposed to the Pickler approach <laughs> when I gave birth, yeah. So, you know, Karen was talking about how important it is to do research and data, but the thing is, we are all walking experiments, and when we grow up, we become who we become, and a lot of it is internalized caregiving, right? Whether it is our parents, our teachers, or other people, they communicate these ideas to us, who we are. And if we are good, then we can give credit to people who raised us, and if we are not, well, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I said that I am one of few people who is not affiliated with Pickler yet. I am probably one of few people here who really know the brain well because I've been poking in the brain inside and out for over 30 years now. <laughs> so my job here today is to prove to you what I know for a fact, and there is a lot of research supporting it, that what happens in childhood doesn't stay in childhood. For people who are not from the US, there is this famous commercial, what happens in Vegas <laughs> stays in Vegas. It's not the case with childhood. <laughs> what happens in childhood doesn't <laughs> stay in childhood. And I'm here to introduce to you what we know from research that has been booming and emerging. But first, let me introduce. <laughs> this is my magic wand. Never leave home without it. <laughs> so of course it's a toy. But also, it's a symbol. It's a symbol of imagination. This is about creating a dream, a vision. Coming up with the idea that seems impossible and making it possible. From a scientific standpoint, there is a part of our brain that was designed just for that. Right here, our prefrontal cortex. And the reason Dr. Pickler was so effective, because this is the part of the brain that is affected by our early experiences, good and bad. Prefrontal cortex is developed when people are present, when we are present, when we are paying attention. The neurons that fire together, wire together. Blood flow goes to the areas of the brain that is activated. And I'll talk about why prefrontal cortex is so important. So this is my symbol for the prefrontal cortex, because it allowed me to come up with my dream. And I want to share a dream with you, that we all work together to create the world where children are treated with dignity and respect. And I feel tearful now because my experience is the opposite of it. I'm exposed to a lot of pain and suffering that is created because as society, we don't get it. <coughs> so this is my dream. And my thinking is, if we can train caregivers exactly how to create peaceful and respectful treatment of children, our world will be a better place. 
And, and maybe world peace will be achievable, right? Karen said, big picture, I'm a big picture thinker. It sounds crazy ambitious though, world peace at the time when we are building walls, right? And a lot of terrorism. <laughs> sounds far-fetched. But this is the saying by Marianne Williamson. There is no <coughs> single effort more radical in its potential for saving the world than a transformation of the way we raise our children. So I'm going to share my personal story with you to explain why I'm standing here today. I shared that my expertise is in neuroscience and neurobiology, but I would have not been standing here if not for my time in prison. In fact, I have been going to prison so many times that I stopped counting. The first time I went, this is maximum security prison, San Quentin, not far from San Francisco, was in 1996. I was a freshly minted psychologist in the state of California. I had come from Russia, and because of my expertise in neuroscience and neuropsychology, I was hired at UCSF Medical Center. I was giving a talk to a group of lawyers who worked with people on death row about the brain functioning and brain dysfunction. One of them asked me after I gave a talk if I will be willing to go to San Quentin and meet with his client to help him appeal his death penalty. He told me a little bit about this man. He has been on death row, he said, for 12 years. He got there when he was only 18. He killed the mother of two children in the commission of robbery. He was addicted to drugs and needed money to buy them. I was intrigued using my knowledge to help a guy who killed a mother and two children, they were orphaned didn't sit well with me. So the first time I went to prison, I was very, very conflicted and anxious. The question I was asking myself, is it morally right to help a criminal? Little did I know that this first time in prison will completely revolutionize my thinking about good and evil. I was intrigued. I loved watching Law and Order at that time. <laughs> and you know, in Law and Order, there are <laughs> bad guys and good guys, right? So and it's e simple. There are people who are evil, and then there are good guys who catch them. So the confusion was, I was a good guy. And now I was going to meet an evil person. The frame of reference I had was my own son. Andrew was 18 at that time. And Andrew was thriving. He graduated from school on top of his class. He was accepted to all the colleges he applied for. Ultimately, he chose UC Berkeley to study computer science. He was not on drugs. He was respectful and kind. So he apparently was a good egg, right? But that other guy was bad seed. But hacking into the brain of a criminal seemed interesting, so I went. On that day, 21 years ago, I was sitting in the room with this guy who was telling me the story in a way that was very matter-of-fact and void of emotions. He told me that he was born to a mother who was 15 years old, addicted to crack. Child Protective Services removed him from her custody. You can imagine that with his brain being exposed to crack in utero, he was not an easy baby to take care of. <coughs> he was shuttled from one foster care to another in East LA. In East LA, people are telling me to <laughs> hold the mic. Can you guys hear me? I have to tell you that every time I tell the story, I get emotional, so I'm breathing. <sighs> because this story broke my heart 
in the way I absolutely didn't expect. So he was living in East LA, shuttled from one foster care to another. He experienced sexual, physical, and mental abuse very early on. In school, he was failing. He could not concentrate. It was difficult for him to learn. He could not form relationships with people. The next thing he told me made me pause. He said, for the first time, I felt good in my skin was when I tried crack. He was 11 years old. It was available because he lived in the zip code where drugs are available for people who don't know how else to survive. When you see death and violence around you, you have to survive. He was using drugs habitually by age 12. At 14, he went to the juvenile detention center where he was exposed to more violence. At 18, he ended up at San Quentin. Luckily for me, I have my magic wand with me, my prefrontal cortex. And what it allows us to do is change perspective. I tried this man's shoes on. I couldn't stop thinking, how would have my son's life <coughs> turned out to be if he lived this man's life? How I would have turned out to be? No bad eggs, no good eggs. We are all born to be good. Even though genetically we are all different, we are born to be good. And if we are not, look for trauma. This is what I'm here to tell you, that at this point in time, we do know, in the 70 years since Dr. Pickler developed her ideas, we know so much more about the brain and the trauma. We know how to prevent it. We know how to heal it. But we are not doing enough of it. When your brain is in trouble, you are in trouble. Now let me tell you a little bit about what I found out continuing going to death row. So at this point in time, I assessed over 80 people on death row. I became an expert in the neurobiology of trauma. I testified in the Supreme Court of, Calif of California on behalf of these children, now adults, who are facing the penalty. And what I discovered, it's always the same story over and over again, and it is the same pattern over and over again. Prefrontal cortex, the organ of civilization, is impaired. Why do we call prefrontal cortex the organ of civilization? Because many good things are housed in this part of the brain. It's my favorite part of the brain. That's why I call it my magic wand. <laughs> Empathy, compassion, imagination, critical thinking, response flexibility, all of it is housed in the prefrontal cortex. Now, how many of you guys have heard about Adverse Childhood Experiences Study? A few. Um, probably, I would say, 5% of us. Well, when I read the study that was published in 2003, pieces of the puzzle came together for me. And if you don't download anything else from my presentation today. I want you to take home this study, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. This is the main finding of the study. Our childhood experiences are powerful determinants of who we become as adults. That's why what happens in childhood doesn't stay in childhood. When I read the study, I thought it would be spreading like a brush fire the idea of it. I thought that all the policymakers 
criminal justice system, teachers, all will know the study. 17,000 people involved. Uh, the study was done by Kaiser, one of the hospitals in California, and uh, Center for Disease Control. It is the largest study on the subject. So what you can see here, adverse childhood experiences are linked to disrupted neurodevelopment, social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, then risk behaviors to cope with it, and then disease, disability, social problems, and early death. I'm talking about horrible outcomes when people end up on death row. You may have your own experiences with trauma being um, young. Not all people end up on death row. There are other ways early trauma affects us. Inability to have intimate relationships, developing of disease. So there are many things that can be linked to adverse childhood experiences, not just <coughs> criminality. This is the partial list of adverse childhood experiences. Household substance abuse, parental separation and divorce, psychological, physical and sexual abuse, emotional neglect, family mental illness, and five more that I don't mention here. Now let's talk a little bit about why childhood experiences are so incredibly important. And this is hot of the press. This is the study from Jack Chankov and his group at Harvard University um, that talks about how there are one million new neural connections made in the brain of a child. Didn't it like blow your mind when you read about it? So before that, we thought it was a thousand new connections each second. And that was mind-blowing in itself. But now they published it just recently in March, that there are one million new connections formed in the brain of a child <coughs> each second. So one minute, 60 million connections. And whether they are the connections to feeling safe or not, that matters. So now let's talk about what is the protective factor, what provides for good brain development, and good brain is the integrated brain, when all parts of the brain work together. This is from uh, the book by Dan Siegel. Four S's that foster secure attachment. The child needs to be seen, safe, soothed, secure. Think about it for a second. Don't you think it's the Pickler approach in a nutshell? <coughs> so before all this was published, Dr. Pickler figured it out. That's why I call her an intuitive neuroscientist. That's why I'm here to pledge my support for anything that the Pickler Association and RAI and <coughs> other agencies that are designed to help people to prevent early trauma. I definitely will provide my support. Now, you may be wondering why you have your magic wands here. <laughs> this is my playful way of inviting you to join in because, you know, my magic wand is not enough. We need to put all our magic wands together in order to join in the effort to prevent something that is very preventable. And if we do, the world will be a better place. And I don't want by being playful to dilute the importance of the work that you all are doing. So I want to finish with this saying that is very profound from Kofi Annan. There is no trust more sacred than the one that the world holds with children. There is no duty more important than ensuring that their rights are respected and their welfare is protected and their lives are free from fear and want and that they grow up in peace. We need to learn from children they know how to be free, how to be themselves, and we all need to learn from them. Thank you.